Jason, thank you so much for the chance to chat with you. I really do appreciate it. This is uh, Eternal Spring is a is a beautiful film. Thank you. And and congratulations. I I hear that it's been submitted as Canada's uh, Canada's submission to the Oscars this year. That's incredible news. Yeah, it's true. Unless this is a really really long dream, because uh, <laughs> yesterday I wasn't sure, but I woke up and it's still the case. So uh, I, I think you're right. I can't believe it, but it's awesome. Uh, I understand. We figured we were the first Mandarin language uh, film uh, in this category. We thought that might be the case. We didn't realize it was the first animation and the first documentary as well. So totally blown away and uh, uh, representing, obviously, um, you know, the, the different diverse communities here with the with the people that are in the film, but also, uh, you know, championing the, the animation and documentary industries here in Canada, too, because we have a lot of great talent. So really feel proud to be representing that with this with this amazing honor. Oh, and, and it's well deserved. Honestly, the film is the film is wonderful. Thank um, you. And and that animation, that blend of animation and and uh, well, real life is the it does not sound professional enough to say, but you know what I'm saying. Like uh, it, that, yeah, the live action footage. Yeah, live action. Thank you. There it is, live action footage. It's a wonderful mix. I was wondering why uh, why did you choose to to blend it in that way? I think it's a combination of things. So one is that you know. First of all, from the animation perspective, I just felt it was unique to come across a, you know, a, a character who could offer up, you know, a film subject who could give us a point of view through his artwork. I felt so we had to explore it through his animation. One, because it's very difficult to reach the people and, and the environments and what actually took place, but also because I think it's so rich to explore that through the mind of an artist who had a very personal experience, and, and it's an opportunity to to use the lens of art uh, to see how we can gain better understanding of an issue, how we can face trauma and loss and longing and all of these things and hopefully gain some type of catharsis through the process as well. So I felt that having the art play that role was very, very powerful. But there's other films who have used animation very well in documentaries and I've enjoyed it. But what was unique here, and I think what sort of led us to incorporate that live action component was, um, you know, is that we want to see the artist. We want to see the real life person. It isn't an, an invisible hand of the director, you know, deciding to, to use the animation for stylistic purposes or artistic purposes. It's sort of intimate and intricate to the storytelling. And, and that was exciting for me. And I think that was also, it also in the process gives us an opportunity to be reminded as we're seeing, you know, we're connecting with these sort of animated characters and we're going on their journey. And then we're brought back into real life and we're seeing the people themselves and we're seeing the people who, who knew the individuals uh, or who were themselves depicted in the animation. We're seeing them process all of this. It just, for me, it added another, had that opportunity to add another layer of sort of depth and, and connection between the audience and keep, you know, to continually remind the, the real life stakes and to see how someone who's creating this artwork is processing um, that artistic uh, journey as they're going through it. Yeah, I, I, I love that. There, the, the live action gives it such a groundedness to it and keeps it, keeps it in the in the real world in many ways but at the mm -hmm. same time the animation sort of gives it some freedom uh to bring the to bring the stories to life in a, in a new way rather than just straight up reenactments it's it's pretty incredible well you know there's something there with like with trauma and with like you know when you're dealing with imprisonment and torture and and, and terrible things that people have gone through you know, if you show it in real life, it's very difficult for people to take for one, uh, you know, and I think it doesn't necessarily, there's another layer of truth that comes through art, actually, it's not necessarily further from objective reality, um, in a, in the sense of, you know, from a documentary perspective is yes, it isn't necessarily the actual image of someone's, you know, torture and trauma, but it it actually, when you're looking at it through the lens of someone who's experienced it, um, you understand what that experience has meant for them in a very personal way, right? And I think that that's what's unique in having someone who's who's connected with this story and who's experienced so much, uh, but is a remarkably talented artist and is willing to share his his journey with us and 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 his process of of creating you know art to remember and to uh, further understand what had happened. Um, yeah, that would just presented a unique opportunity for us. Uh, it's 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 such a wonderful opportunity, as you said there, because and, and even it talks about how uh, his art. Was, forgive me, is it pronounced Daishon? Daishon, yeah, Daishon. Daishon. Um, he even says, you know, I love telling these stories. They express Chinese values, and and yeah. he talks about talks about heroes. 
Yes. And uh, I think one of the things that he says, if I'm correct, he says the definition of a hero is determination and kindness. Uh, I was just wondering how that resonated with you and, and what your definition of a hero would be. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, it was interesting to me, like one of the reasons I incorporated that sort of hero aspect is that Dashong is known in the comic book world for his work on Justice League and Star Wars and, you know, these kind of like comic Western comic book heroes. But when we started talking with him and we're even just getting into sort of like the background of what inspired him to get into art and stuff. And he started to talk about these um, Chinese comics. And actually I have a stack of them at home somewhere, just not next to me. I'd, I'd show them to you otherwise, but they're, um, you know, the Chinese comics were that were popular in his time showed a lot of these stories of, of figures in, in ancient times who were real life figures or, or people who were perhaps kind of lionized in the, in the history books later on, but they were, you know, showed heroic qualities that sort of underpin the Chinese value system. So whether that's loyalty or courage and all of these different types of things, but there, there are stories about people in Chinese history. And this is what connected with him. And these are the heroes that he wanted to embody. It's just that when he became such an accomplished artist, you know, the, the, the career options for him to kind of reflect those stories just weren't, weren't there in the same way. But I thought that that was interesting because he shared this early on in our interview. And then I was started to see towards the end of our journey with him, how he started to talk about the individuals uh, behind the TV hijacking in China. So Liang, the sort of mastermind and big truck, who was his, you know, sort of, uh, uh, you know, sidekick in this, you know, high story journey. And you start to see how he just, he talks about these people. And so we probe that a little bit and, and he starts to, say how he feels these are the real embodiment of the heroes that inspired him to get into comics. You know, it's not this super normal person who exemplifies all of these things, but these are people who deal with real risks, real challenges, real loss, and still somewhere find the courage to hold true to their values and their principles and to speak up in the face of injustice. And I think that requires a lot more courage than the people you see sort of adorning the front pages of comic books. And so uh, resonated with me, obviously, but I also felt that was very uh, pointed as part of his own personal story arc in terms of how he's coming to, to view an event that at first he had mixed feelings about because of its impact on his life and many other people's lives, but spending time with these people, how he sees that, you know, in the lens of what originally inspired him to get into comics in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's incredible. I think, you know, it, in many ways, it puts into perspective our whole, the, the what we're actually looking for in our in our heroes, you know, it's not about, it's not about the powers. It's, it's much more about character and we see that much more in real life. Um, I, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the, uh, I don't know if heist is too much of a word, but, mm -hmm. uh, in some way of a, the, certainly the hijacking of, of the, the, uh, the television channel. Um, this is rooted, this is an incredible story, just an incredible mm -hmm. story. Um, and you know, we, we see films, we see heist films, but they, they're, they're often like personal vendettas or something, but this, there's something so deeply rooted in this. It seems to be rooted in, in, in truth. And I was wondering for you, uh, what's the power of the, of the, the moment, the hijacking of, of the television system? Yeah. So this film had kind of coming across across this story, it, I felt it really had everything for me. Like, I mean, from a filmmaker perspective, yeah, you know, oftentimes a high story can be kind of trite, like you're robbing a bank or something. It's not necessarily something with a lot of gravity or meaning to it beyond that. It's just a fun ride. But people get into those stories and they root for characters. And the fact that this had all of the elements of a high story, you know, the plan, the kind of mastermind, all the kind of unique characters. And then you know, things obviously not going as planned. It's, it just felt like a high story that wrote itself, but it had this other layer to it, the meaning of like doing something, do pulling off a heist for a reason that you don't normally see, which for, you know, for some, a reason much bigger than themselves, you know, to, to kind of speak up in the face of over, overwhelming injustice and, and danger and threats, right? And, and I just, um, I felt that personally getting to know this story these individuals and what they pulled off it just really shook me it resonated with me deeply and you spend time with this and then you're you just want to be able to share that story with people but you you know you're confined to a, a 90 minute format and and this you know the, the dimensions of the screen and it's how can you communicate 
uh, how deeply a story and individuals are resonating with you in a way that people can can grasp, right? And so that's where the the, the kind of elements of the high story are, are I guess, are helpful. Um, and it's a lot of how do we pull this all together? And I think the other challenge was too, is that Falun Gong is not something that's very familiar to people. If they heard about it, that's probably, a, oh, I heard there's a repression, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple decades ago. Mm -hmm. It's not something that's top of mind <clears throat> or in the news nowadays. So how do you take a subject like this that isn't familiar to people, give people the background without boring them and allow them to get into this. And, and definitely the heist element is super, super helpful in that regard. Yeah, I, it's so the the fact that it's so rooted around Falun Falun Gong is mm -hmm. uh, is incredible to me, uh, and and the threat of Falun Gong when you hear all these people talking about they want to live lives of peace and humility and uh, you know uh, there's that the wonderful story where the the young girl says well somebody bullied me and I did not fight back and they're like oh well you know you took the right approach and I, I was wondering what is it about Falun Gong to you that it, that it was such a threat. Yeah, so I encountered Falun Gong myself um, before there was a crackdown in China because I had an interest in when I was in high school in um, Eastern med like philosophy and meditation and such. And so I came across it without this filter of the political controversy in China. And you know that's when this campaign began in China, and all of a sudden people are being rounded up for practicing it, and the government saying it's evil and dangerous, and we need to get rid of it. It's it, all of the narrative I heard just really didn't reconcile with what I had found by you know encountering these people and the, the meditation, and and the sort of tenets and the of the practice, and and so I've spent more time. Uh, that's what sort of sparked my interest and passion for the the you know for the situation in China that they had been enduring and. And I spent more time looking into this. And I think my my thought on it at this point is that, you know, if you look historically at, at what's happened in China, uh, there's this kind of ideological, I think, uh, sort of contest for supremacy since the Communist Party took over. If you look at it, a lot of these um, practices, uh, whether those Buddhist practices or Taoist practices or other traditions in China, were deeply rooted and they're part of the culture. And when the Communist Party took control in 1949, this is a, a Marxist ideology that comes from the West. It's not, it's not part of uh, you know, the traditional Chinese culture. So there's this, first of all, I mean, in general, when you see in, in communist countries, there's often been a repression of religion and, you know, and, and free ideas and all this kind of thing. So that's something that's present generally in, in communist societies. But I think in particular in China, um, there was a particular concern around belief systems that were rooted in the traditional Chinese culture because the party had made strong efforts to uproot that in its, you know, striving for sort of ideological supremacy there. So when they took power, you know, they destroyed the temples, the monks were forced to marry. Uh, and now even today, they do have sort of state approved religions, but those are all, you know, a limited set of faiths that that have to put the, the sort of communist leadership above their own God. And that's what makes them, quote unquote, patriotic religions, right? So there's this real fear, I think, of religious belief in China. And you can see it now. I think that's the thing, too, that makes this a universal story that isn't, although it is definitely about Falun Gong. And I do hope that people can um, return to seeing Falun Gong as part of the human rights concerns in China, even if it's just not talked about as much more recently because it's been going on for a while. Mm. But aside from that, I do think that the, what we see in the treatment of Falun Gong is reflected as well in the treatment of the Uyghur Muslims in the northwest of China, where you see scores of people potentially in the millions interned in these camps where they're also coerced into abandoning their traditions and their religious beliefs and such. You've seen it in the, in the repression of the Tibetan uh, community, the Buddhists as well for, for many years. I think the other thing that made Falun Gong such a particular target is that in contrast to the Uyghurs and the Tibetans, although the suppression of those groups has been extraordinarily severe as well, I don't mean to, to diminish that in any regard, but for the party, they were able to create this sort of narrative of an us versus them more easily because those groups were ethnically distinct, geographically distinct. So the Uyghurs are in the Northwest, the Tibetans are in a certain region, and they're able to sort of portray through state narratives that this is a struggle over, you know, separatist forces wanting to take control politically of different lands and this kind of stuff. So they're able to, to sort of other those groups more easily. I think Falun Gong concerned them more deeply because it was completely widespread among the Han ethnicity, which is the majority ethnicity in China. And there's people of all walks of life who were practicing it. So when they saw the numbers in Falun Gong grow to be, you know, potentially in the tens of millions, some reports saying even 
approaching 100 million or at that number, like potentially more than the members of the Communist Party. That is what sort of, I think, um, created, led this sort of concern and, di- and unease around any kind of religious or spiritual belief to the level where they, they uh, decided to crack down on it and ban it. See, it's interesting, you know, that's sort of what I, I would have wondered is, is certainly if it was about control and about maintaining that, but I never would have thought of it being actually something as uprooting uh, traditional culture at the beginning. I'd never, I'd never heard that before. I didn't realize that that was part of the communist, uh, communist journey into, or in, in power, that there's something more deeply rooted there. Mm-hmm. Um, that's mm-hmm. really interesting. I didn't know that. Um, yeah, China has a really long entrenched history, right? So I mean, like thousands of years, and there have been emperors who were sort of proponents of either Buddhism or Taoism. And so there's these lines that are are sort of blurred between sort of what is religious and what is just sort of um, general Chinese culture and belief, right? And so the the Communist Party has been kind of at odds with that. Wow. Wow. Um... Uh, absolutely. Uh, Jason, you know, as we're, we're starting to run out of time here, I'm just from your perspective, what is it that you hope uh, the audience takes away from the, the experience of the film? Yeah, so, I mean, there are specifics and then there are universals. I think, you know, documentary to me is, has to be, if it's going to be well made, I think it still has to be more art than it is uh, sort of history, right? It has to have, not just to delve into Um, the particulars, which are important, but into the universals that everyone can resonate with. And so when you come across a subject, even if it's something that maybe you've had personal experience and so it connects with you deeply, you want people to know about it, it's not really enough. I think you have to drill down and find what's universal here. So I do hope that, uh, like all of the things I mentioned, that people are aware of, you know, religious persecution in China, the situation with Falun Gong in particular. But I think for everyone, it's this, it's this struggle to be understood. It's this willingness to to speak up in the face of injustice, even when there's, you know, significant costs uh, and potential risks at stake and that struggle for the truth in the midst of all of that. I I think that a lot of people um, can resonate with it. And we see this type of thing, you know, it's interesting because we shared this film and I was thinking, well, you know, this this story really resonates with me. And for me, I've seen these kind of universal ideas in it, Um, but I was wondering whether people would look at it as an event, you know, 20 years ago is it kind of in the past? And then you start submitting it to festivals and people are reaching out and saying, wow, this is so timely. And I'm like, well, why do you see that, right? Like, why are you seeing it as so timely? And people look at it, even a number of people who've introduced the film have made comparison to what you see going on in Ukraine, where you know, with the Russian situation, there's a courageous state TV broadcaster, a lady who held up a sign and sort of defying the, the war in Ukraine and, 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 and Putin's agenda and on the air, which was obviously very bold. She's faced consequences for that. And you know this whole idea of when you're going to meet out some kind of atrocities against people, in order to be able to do that, you need to construct a false narrative that people, a large number of people are gonna to need to buy into. And so that's how, for me, it hit me of like how important a role propaganda plays in, in abuse. And if this film can provide an opportunity to have people maybe dial it back a little bit from, from views and opinions that are really sort of set in stone about these other, these people are others, these people are to be looked down on, these people are not to be treated with the same kind of respect and humanity as we might expect ourselves. If people can look at that and kind of open their minds a little bit as well and, and, uh, and come with that, that perspective, I think that that's, uh, that's something positive that can connect with anyone uh, and hopefully not, not only the, the, the particular community reflected in the film. Uh, absolutely absolutely you're right it it connects it it connects differently on a number of levels and it, it honestly it's a wonderful piece jason i really do appreciate it uh the chance to chat with you about it i certainly wish you the best um, thank you hopefully uh the film goes on brings home some oscar oscar gold it's been a while I'd love to see that <laughs> i don't want to say it out loud yet i'll just keep okay. doing my best well, here but uh we'll I'll say it hopefully we will Uh, But no, thank you so much for the chance to chat with you, Jason. I I, uh, have a great day and I wish you the best. Thank you so much.